Welcome to Movie Talk, our weekly show about movies, the people who star in them, and the people who create them. As a result of his memorable performances in Social Network and J. Edgar, Army Hammer, who's with us today, has been in great demand as a young leading man in Hollywood. He starred in Mirror Mirror, and of course is now playing the Lone Ranger opposite Johnny Depp. So this may be early in Army Hammer's career, but he has nonetheless worked for such distinguished directors as Clint Eastwood, David Fincher, and has some damn good roles. Eastwood and Fincher, that's such a contrast in style and temperament, isn't it? It is. Uh, they're pretty much the exact dichotomy of each other. It's, uh, you have one who has sort of a voracious appetite and aptitude for work and, uh, you know, countless takes and never losing focus for a second. And you have the other guy who's been doing it longer than most directors have been alive and knows the, how easy it can be and enjoys sort of like the effortless ease at which he operates. So the first one is Fincher. Yep. Who lots of takes. Lots of takes. And lots of energy. Lot, you know, it's funny, he has lots of energy, but it's never, it's never sort of, um, he's not an extrovert in any way on set. He, you never see his energy, you just, you see his focus. You see him standing at the monitors, standing all day, not moving, just watching every little detail and every little aspect and never losing focus, never getting bored of a scene, never letting anyone else take over, always, you know, on top of it. And Clint? I mean, not only does he not do many takes, but I remember some actors complained that he prints their rehearsal. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He did that Did he times. do that to you? Absolutely. Well, you know what he would do is, um, you know, you'd walk into a room that would be completely open and there'd be no marks, nothing. And he'd say, okay, uh, do you guys just want to put the scene up on its feet? And you go, well, where do you want us to stand? And he'd go, wherever you'd like. It's like, <laughs> <sighs> okay, uh, I'll stand at... Uh, I'll stand here, and then you know Leo will go and do his thing, and then uh, and then we'll give it a try, and Clint will go, great, okay, moving on, and then he'll get up and walk away, and it's like whoa, 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 whoa. that yeah. was that was the rehearsal, you know? yeah. But he is a gracious man, Clint Eastwood. Absolutely. And Absolutely. I know people, some actors are intimidated by him, but he is, he is. I don't on think their it's side. just actors who are intimidated by Clint Eastwood. Yeah. I think it's everybody. Yeah, yeah. Edgar, good to see you. Good to see you, Lawrence. I'd like to introduce you to Mr. Clyde Tolson. Graduate from George Washington University tonight with a law degree. Mm. Congratulations, Mr. Tolson. Thank you, Mr. Hoover. I believe you are one of our most distinguished alumni. I did, yes. I, uh, I do have a degree from the school, yes. Mm. I was just admiring your suit, Mr. Tolson. Should take a lesson from him, Lawrence. Thank you, sir. Now, J. Edgar, once again, one would not expect Clint Eastwood to make J. Edgar. Now, did, when he came to you about that, what what did you think? Uh, well, he didn't he didn't come to me uh, mm -hmm. specifically. I think you came to him. Well, I think his casting director came to us right. and said, you know, I think she had just seen Social Network and said, you know, I guess a suit fits all right on this guy. There's gonna be a lot of suits in this movie. Why don't you come in and audition? And they sent me the script and I read it and. Uh, I mean, to be perfectly honest, I didn't, I didn't get it. Like, mm -hmm. I, I understood sort of the value of the script and how good it was, but I didn't, I didn't understand Clyde Tolson. So I responded. I said, you know what, I, I really appreciate it, but I, I, I can't come in and read for this. You know, because I was thinking, you know, I can't go in there and read for Clint Eastwood on something that I'm not 100% sure on because I don't want to put anything but my best foot forward for him. Mm -hmm. So I, I passed. I said, you know, I, I appreciate it, but I, I can't come in and read this. And then, uh, you that know. That was a real dumbass thing to do. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean fortunately, <laughs> I, you know. As hard as I worked against it, it all kind of paid off, I guess, you know. <laughs> so what happened then? Did, did who persuade, when, what made you see the light? Uh, I got another call from my agent that said, uh, you know, Clint would like you to come in. And I was like, great, how do I argue with that? Like, there's no, shoot, okay, now I have to go in. Uh, so, so I went in and I had, a, I had an amazing talk with Fiona Weir, who was a lady who was casting the movie, and uh, I spent probably an hour and a half with her just talking, asking her questions, sort of trying to understand it and all that, and then... Uh, and I left, and I and then I went from there and had dinner with a friend of mine who's gay, and I was just like, a, who's an older gay man, and I said, please, dude, like, explain to me, like, why did he stick around so long? Why did he take this abuse? Yeah. Why, if there was never any sort of culmination to this, why, why would he put up with it all? He being Clyde Tolson. He being Clyde, yeah. of course, yeah. And uh, 
and and uh, you know he broke it down for me. He's like you can't you can't choose who you fall in love with, and especially in a time when you have feelings inside of you that feel so alien and yeah. so foreign and so bizarre, and you see and you recognize a spark of a same thing in someone else. Mm -hmm. There's nothing that could stop you from just wanting to look at that person and say, "We both have this. Just acknowledge it. Deal with this <laughs> yeah. with me. I can be there for you." Yeah, that's and great. you know there was there was that one moment in this in the script that was um, you know. Uh, after Clyde basically says, you know, you didn't, you didn't do this, you didn't do that, Dillinger, this, that, you know, and what you wrote was lies. Uh, at the end of that scene, Hoover kisses Clyde, yeah. and that's the first time in the script and the only time in the script where Hoover expresses his emotion towards Clyde as opposed to, you know, the other way around. And I think that that one kiss that would have been worth it for Clyde, you know, to stick around for another 20 years of abuse to just get one more display of affection. But the downside for you is that forever journalists are going to say to you um, what was it like to kiss Leonardo yeah you know, and what a pain yeah. in the ass question that must be okay, yeah. uh, I'm sure there are worse questions I could be asked uh, but uh, but yeah I do get that one quite a bit now Clint Eastwood says that the key reason that he got interested in this movie was because Leonardo DiCaprio wanted to play that role mm. and how early in the process did you learn of Leo's interest Leo was already attached by the yeah, time I came around. Right. By the time the script So that must have me. been a nice inducement for you. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, Clint would have been all that I needed. You know, the only impetus I needed would have been work with Clint Eastwood. Fine. Sure. What do you need me to do? I'll be the janitor. I'll stand in the trash can, whatever. Yeah. Fine. Yeah. You know, but then of course getting to work opposite of Leonardo DiCaprio, who, you know, is one of one of our generation's greatest actors. I mean, that's that's a treat as well. And then of course, you know, Dame Judi Dench and Naomi Watts yeah, and all right. that. It's a know, great so. cast. Yeah, it was. There are a lot of young actors in town who really hate you because you've gone from one terrific role after to another, and now you're going to be the Lone Ranger, for God's sake. I mean, they feel you're a Hollywood insider, you know your way around, and that's why you get all these great roles. But that's not true, is it? No, it's not true. Uh, Where did you grow up to begin with? Well... Well, I'll tell you. Well, first of all, the good news about you know any actor in this town hating me is that most actors in this town are about this tall. So I'm not I'm not too worried about <laughs> That's it. That's true, especially the stars. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I'm I'm I don't have like an inside track. You know, I didn't I didn't have you know someone that I called and said you know can you put me in a movie or anything like that. You know, I put in the same sort of requisite years of grunt work. You know, being rejected in every audition. You know, going to acting classes and being told you're the worst in the class. You know, being told did you'll never work. Did your family want you to be in the movies? No, they hated the idea. Hated it. I mean, I was I was immediately ostracized as soon as I decided to become an actor. It wasn't something that my, my family promoted in any way. You know, in fact, it wasn't until I, I booked the role of Billy Graham, and that's when my mom got excited about me being an actor, and then I booked the role of Batman, and that's when my dad became excited about me being an actor. So, Yeah, to be the young Billy Graham, and that was in a TV movie, right? Uh, it wasn't a TV movie, although it had, uh, you know, standards of quality even lower than most TV movies. Uh, it was just a small independent movie that we did uh, that Robbie Benson right. actually oh, directed, right. which he was fantastic, and that project was so much fun to be a part of, unfortunately, you know. Uh, you know, pardon the pun, but there was a holy war after it was finished, and everybody, you know, sort of split, and then the movie fell apart. Yeah, that's, that's, that happens. Yeah, more often than not. So now, again, far from being a Hollywood brat, you grew up mostly in the Cayman Islands. Did, right? yeah. Which is a pretty strange place to grow up. Yeah, it, I mean, it's definitely, you know, as a kid, you never, you never realize that it's not the norm, but, you know, coming back to L.A. and being like, Wait, what do you mean you don't know how to cut open a coconut? Like, you've never caught a crab? What are you talking about? It's, it's, it's a weird thing, you know, looking back on it, but it was great. Fun. So you're a, a beach kid, but not a Malibu beach kid. Right. Like yeah. Rob Lowe and An actual and beach kid. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. And so what in God's name got you interested in being an actor? Well, I always loved movies. Like, movies, movies for me were always a sort of escape, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, growing up on an island was amazing. It was anything you could ever ask for as a kid, you know, having that much unlimited freedom and space and, and you know, the ocean and you could fish and ride jet skis. I mean, it was great as a kid, but, you know, at the same time, you're still growing up on a small island where you get movies three or four months after they come out in America. And, you know, you, you don't have access to a lot of things that you can read about and stuff like that. So movies were always like, a, you know, an escape. Like, you go somewhere cold. There's nowhere cold on the Cayman Islands, so you go somewhere cold in a movie. You know, it's like I, I was always just able to get lost in movies, and I just really loved and appreciated the, the sort of the craft and the art of it. Well, I saw on the web you made a list of your five favorite movies. And it's an interesting list because Apocalypse was number yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. Those, those were movies to get you through the 
the holidays. Yeah. Gets, yeah, that's a pretty dark movie, dude. I it, love it though. Yeah. I it's it's like it's tactile. It's visceral. It's like yeah. you watch that movie, and I think as a civilian, it's as close as you're going to get to sort of experiencing the manic craziness that was, you know, that that is possible in wartime. You know. Well, listen, that that's also possible in making movies because yeah, totally. making that movie was a study oh, yeah. in operatic craziness. Yeah, 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 yeah. Have you ever been on a movie where? The, everything about about it seemed crazy, just as an act. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The uh, the the Billy Graham movie was was definitely one of those movies. Really. Yeah. Oh, man. At one point we had, and I'm not going to say any names, but at one point we had one of the producers show up to the set, convinced that the director was possessed by the devil, so they were going to exercise the demons out of it. I mean, it was just like, I'm sitting there going, "What the hell is going on? We're just trying to make a damn movie. Everybody yeah. needs to calm down." So now let's get down and dirty here. To what degree is your name an advantage or a disadvantage? I mean, my wife and I pitch and putt at the Armand Hammer golf course. Yeah. I mean, the guy who was famous, your grandfather, great-grandfather, was the, the, the Occidental Petroleum. Mm -hmm. He was famous as a he, the tough guy. He yeah. was one tough oil man. Yeah, yeah. So now you carry that name. Has that been a help or a disadvantage to you? I would say had I chosen to sort of follow the the you know, the family's path and gone into business, it would have been much more advantageous than it is in acting. Yeah. You know, it's it's the kind of name now that gets me laughed at before, you know, it gets me any sort of respect. You know, yeah. I mean, had I gone into oil, it, it might have been a different story. I probably would have gotten more of a, oh, is that, a, oh, interesting, interesting. But now it's like, ar ar Army Hammer? What the hell is that? Who's that? Who's that? That's you? Oh my God, okay, come on. You know, like, it's like that kind of thing, you know, so. I, I, it definitely didn't. It definitely didn't help me in any way. Like yeah. there, there was nothing about the way I grew up or any sort of the advantages that I had growing up. You know, none of that helped me in what I was doing because essentially I had to give it all up to, to pursue acting because my family wasn't supportive of it initially. I had to drop out of high school. I had to, you know, I had to give up on everything that they were they were doing to help me and, and just really go on my own with it. Mm -hmm. And why did you decide to use Army, which makes people think of Army Orchard, yeah. rather than Armand? Uh, it's definitely less of a mouth, mouthful than Armand, like especially you know like a six-year-old boy. Hello, I'm Armand Hammer. Like that's yeah. it's kind of goofy. Uh, <laughs> and I just I've I've had Army since I was born. That was just my name because Armand, my great grandfather, he was alive the same time I was. So right. he was Armand, and he called me um, like a Russian nickname, and just Army was just how it sort of translated. Let me tell you something, Mr. Winklevoss, Mr. Winklevoss. Since you're on the subject of right and wrong, this action, this meeting, the two of you being here is wrong. It's not worthy of Harvard. It's not what Harvard saw in you. You don't get special treatment. We never asked. Oh, just start another project? If you like, have, like we're making a diorama for a science fair? If you have fair? a problem with that, Mr. Winklevoss. We never asked for special the treatment. The courts are always at your disposal. Is there anything else I can do for you? Oh, you can take the Harvard student handbook and shit. Thank you very much for your time, sir. Whoops. Broke a 335-year-old doorknob. Social Network has become a legendary movie. Legendary. I don't know whether you felt it would be when you were making the picture, but uh, that's the, the, there were so many lines. It's so talky. Right, I right, should right, think yeah. as an actor, you'd say to yourself, is this going to work as a movie? I, I think as an actor, you look at it and you go, oh, this writer made it so easy for me. Yeah. You know, I mean, good writing is so much easier to get out of your mouth naturally as an actor yeah. than bad writing. You know, it's like the bad writing is the writing you have to do all of the work on. Yeah. You have to go back and get the imagery and you have to, the backstory, this or that. You know, I mean, of course, you do, this, you do the same due diligence with a great script, but it's, all the work is done for you. All the heavy lifting, the writer has figured it all out. So getting to say Aaron Sorkin's lines was like a treat. And getting to be two guys, though, that distracting a bit for an actor, no? The Winkle Voss twins? Yeah, yeah. I mean, considering that was really my first big movie, uh, sort of having the burden of playing two characters, it was a little nerve-wracking at first, but at the same time, you know, it was double the chance to get to say Aaron Sorkin's lines and double the chance <laughs> to get to be directed by David Fincher and double the chance to get to do what I loved. I don't mind that we lost to the Dutch today by less than a second. That was a good race, and that was a fair race, and they'll see us again. What I mind, and what you should mind, is showing up on Monday for a race that was run on Sunday. We tried talking to ourselves, we tried writing a letter, we tried the ad board, and we tried talking to the president of the university. Now, I am asking you, for the last time, let's take the considerable resources at our disposal and sue him in federal court. Come on. I need a real drink.
Screw it. Let's gut the frickin' nerd. You play twins, stuffed up, rich kids from Harvard, a mm -hmm. um, lot of attitude, and I should think a lot of people, even girlfriends, would say, oh, God, this guy really is a Winklevoss. <laughs> but you're not a Winklevoss at all, are you? No. Uh, in fact, I appreciate you saying that very much. Uh, no, I mean, I, I'm six foot five. I think that's about all of the similarities that I have with them. Uh, I, I, I'm, I, you're right. Like I'm sure, I'm sure there are people, probably a lot of people, especially in this town, who look at who I am or you know, sort of my family and all that, and say, well, that's why he got the part. Of course, he is. He is that guy. And but he it's did like, go to Harvard. Yeah, of course. Like, but you the, didn't go to Harvard. No, I didn't even graduate high school. I dropped out of high school. Like I, that's how unwinkle boss like I am. You know, it's like. I think they're great guys, you know. But uh, I would like to think that I don't have any sort of sense of entitlement. Like I, I feel like. I want to earn everything that I get. I want to. I want to value what I have and really appreciate it, which is why I didn't go into the family business and take what would have been easy. I mean, I could have, I could have gone to you know college and then immediately had a great job, you know, and known that I had job security and known what I was going to do the rest of my life, but I would have never felt like I earned it or deserved it. You know, it's like this is something that I put in as much work as anybody else who succeeded in this business because there really are no byways there's no loops there's there's no one you can call to say you know give me a part in this because yeah. you might get one part but if you're bad in it you're not going to get another That's part true. you know I could barely hear you all the way down there I do have one question about the evening mm -hmm. there was a girl there she had black hair it was very beautiful beautiful I think she's the most beautiful woman in the whole world. Agreed to disagree. Let's leave it at that. Mm -hmm. Do you know her? Ivory skin, black hair. Her hair is not black, it's raven. And she's 18 years old, and her skin has never seen the sun, so of course it's good. Mirror Mirror, which is a picture with a very eccentric trailer. I'm dying to see it. Yeah, eccentric, yeah. Who do you play? Uh, I play uh, Prince Andrew Alcott in the, in the story, and he is sort of, uh, he's the, you know, Prince Charming of this typical Snow White story. And did you take the role simply because you wanted to do tights? Uh, yes, tights and a cod piece. That was really, once I saw that, I was like, you don't have to pay me, fine. <laughs> uh, no, uh, honestly, I, I took that movie because uh, I, I wanted to work with Tarsem Singh, uh, the director of the movie. I, yeah. I think he is an incredible visualist, maybe one of the best that we have. And uh, I, I, you know, I mean, the cell for me was just so visually striking, and then the fall also so beautiful to watch, and, and the fact that there was zero CGI in that movie, I mean, it's, it's shocking, and I, I wanted to see how this sort of Indian crazy madman did this, and, uh, and that, that was really the reason I did this, and also to work with Julia. Yeah, exactly, all this and Julia Roberts, too. That didn't hurt, yeah, yeah. that definitely didn't hurt. Yeah. But, you know, uh, I did have stipulations. You know, uh, Tarsem and I sat down for lunch on Jones on 3rd, just right down there. Mm -hmm. And uh, and he was like, I want you to do this. And I, was, and I was like, okay, first of all, let me tell you, I love you. Like, I'll do whatever you want me to do, but I won't play Prince Charming. Like, that to me sounds so saccharine and nauseating and ridiculous, like, two-dimensional and boring. Like, you can't do anything with that as an actor. And he was like, well, what do you want to do? And I was like, let's, like, brainstorm about this. Let's, let's get into this and figure out, like, something interesting we can do to this guy. So... We gave him like a backstory. He's he's now not a character who just sort of shows up and rescues Snow White with a kiss and then they're off happily ever after, you know? Can't fight you. Why not? Because you're a girl. I don't fight girls. <laughs> Perhaps I should reconsider. Yeah. The queen has you in her thrall, can't you see? She's manipulating you. That is absurd. The queen would be just fine if you and your friends stopped robbing her. You. Should we help her? She's doing pretty good on her own. You're starting imminently the Lone Ranger. Mm -hmm. You are the Lone Ranger. Yes, sir. Gore Verbinski, who's just a terrific director. Yeah. A few hits great. in his background. Yeah. Like Pirates of the Caribbean and Rango, which is terrific. Again, I love Rango, an interesting, yeah. bizarre movie. Yeah. But that's that's what makes it really fun, the fact that it's so bizarre and interesting. Because most of the time when you make a movie with computers, it has a tendency of feeling too perfect. Yeah. Like Rango is the kind of movie where it's like, it is all kinds of fast and loose the whole That's time. Right. It, it could fall off the rails at any time, you know? I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a really fun sort of Western, you know? But if a director comes to you again and says, I'm doing The Lone Ranger, yeah. 
Now, I know I would be more concerned than playing Clyde Tolson, J. Edgar's gay lover. Yeah. Now, obviously, did, did he send you a script or did Gore sit down and explain what his take is on this character? This was a this was a really similar process to J. Edgar, where you know I'm still, you know, low enough on the totem pole that I have to sort of fight for jobs. So this was the kind of thing where I heard they were doing Lone Ranger, and I said, "That sounds awesome. I love I love westerns like that. For me, that's one of my favorite genres. I know they typically don't do well, especially now, but yeah. I mean, which is why Lone Ranger is not. It's not strictly a western. There's so many more aspects to it, which I mean, you see, it's going to be incredible, but. But at the core of it, I'm going to get to ride a horse and shoot guns. Like that's going to be really that's like the six-year-old boy in me is just like yes, you know. So but that are you going to sh are you going to kiss Johnny Depp? Am I? Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, it depends on how uh, you know. D does he do off-camera lines? You know, that that'll that'll be brownie points. We'll see. <laughs> Again, you have a you have great choice in co-stars. Mm -hmm. I mean, Johnny Depp. That's kind of an interesting guy. Have you ever have you spent time with him? Mm -mm. Yeah, because, you know, all of us sort of wonder who is the real Johnny Depp. Yeah. And it's going to be interesting, Johnny Depp as Tonto. That's an interesting character to get to know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's one of the things that I'm really interested in is uh, sort of appreciating the processes that other actors go through. And I'm, I'm interested to see what his thing is like. I mean, I've heard, I've heard, you know, from nobody connected just from around town that he has like an earplug that he wears and he listens to, you know, music or whatever when he's acting. You know, I'm, I'm going to ask him about that if it's true, sort of why he does. I don't know, just like see what the deal is. I think he's going to bring a really interesting and fresh spin to it. Uh, and the script itself, which is so precise and tight and just perfect as it is, it's, uh, I mean, you can see Johnny all over it and he is going to crush this. Like he's, he's really going to do a great job with this. Now, has it occurred to you that your first instincts about characters that are offered you are always wrong? No, but it's entirely possible. <laughs> yeah. now, Clyde Tolson, your first reaction was incorrect. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Lone Ranger, your first reaction was incorrect. Uh -huh. So if I were your agent, I'd really sit you down and say, you have a wonderful way, Army, of backing into great roles. Yeah. Yeah. It's sort of like, I guess I'm Mr. Magoo. I just stumble into the sort of right <laughs> roles. Or maybe I just say no at first because I'm good at negotiating. Yeah, that's true, mm. right. A bigger <laughs> paycheck and, yeah. and more lines. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. So Gore Verbinski and, and Johnny Depp, they have worked together, had some <clears throat> successes. A, a little bit, a little moderate success. Yeah, yeah, a few pirates along the way. I think the two I think the two of them actually as a team have made almost two billion dollars. <laughs> something cr I mean, I don't quote me, but something yeah. crazy like that. Right. Yeah. So you're sort of breaking into a serious relationship there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The odd man out. I'm third wheeling it. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> yeah. It'll be fun. I, I think it will. I mean, it'll be, who knows, maybe I'll feel like the new kid. Maybe I'll feel like I'm sort of, you know, witnessing the inside of someone's very intimate relationship. But mm -hmm. who knows, like it might be, it might be amazing. I think it will be. I think so too. Well, when it's all over, come back and see us. Okay. It's I'll have great, a good scoop. Great fun to talk to yeah, you. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it, man. Thank you very much for having me.